The next level of valve phasing is continuously variable control. It uses controlled oil pressure to position cam phasing vane that will continuously vary cam timing. An electrical solenoid controls a spool valve, which is a hydraulic term, that opens or blocks two oil passages providing directional control to hold the position, the current timing, advance the timing, or retard the timing. And these three modes will be utilized, and we'll talk about how this is accomplished as we go through here. We're going to use predominantly intake valve phasing for the first part. A control valve directs pressure to one side of the rotor's veins or the other, rotating the rotor as required to advance retard camshaft timing as directed by the computer. Now, this is a rotary uh, phaser. We also have linear phasers. Position changes are verified by monitoring the changes in the cam signal position. A typical VVT oil control solenoid is driven by a 300, 300 hertz signal that uses duty cycle controls. This is a diagram of what that looks like. We have two oil supplies, one to the front, one to the back of the control spool that's going to move back and forth on the same helical gear we have used with previous systems. Here's what two of the varieties are. One is rotary, here's one that's linear. Linear at the bottom, rotary at the top. They are magnets and they tend to collect particles. We have to keep stressing this because we want to point out that ones we find that are sticking and not working frequently have metal chips or other contamination blocking them up. The uh, cam sprocket is driven. Now this particular system uses one single cam drive. We're going to show you one later that doesn't. Notice the spool valve up there. Let's talk about that spool valve and how we're going to control it. We have duty cycle control. Now this is one that's ground enabled, meaning we supply ground and it turns on electromagnet. This is what the whole thing looks like as we disassemble it. The black spool valve is down in the middle. There's a plunger that's the magnetic. That horrible coil at the top is where we cut it, suddenly open this up. And then the valve itself is to the left. You're looking at a close-up of it. And you can see dirt and contaminations. All of these we find that are malfunctioning have different levels of dirt and contamination. Let's talk about these dirty control valves. Here's a close-up view. Notice the plug ports on this dirty control valve. This is due to neglect. This is from our linear ones. As we look at this, we see metal pieces and chips inside at different places. And look at the amount of varnish accumulated in this. We're having problems with poor maintenance that cause severe problems with these. And they're very, the Ford 5.4 right now, three valve, they're blowing spark plugs out of the heads because of stuck VVD controls and minimum plug threading, which has been a problem with the modular engines. GM is having problems because of a screen filter ahead of the control becomes clogged. Timing cover has to be removed to clean the filter, and it gets to be a real hassle. We can't blame vehicles when motorists fail to change oils. But if you have a head repair, there are kits where you can repair the Ford heads. But be aware of the difficulty of getting access Getting access may be far more difficult than actually reaming out the head, re-threading it, and putting in an adapter. Make sure any kit you used is approved for Ford because it's an aluminum head and the heat transfer is important. Here is what we're going to be using with our intake. We're going to be using variable duty cycle. 50% duty cycle blocks both output ports, which holds the phaser in its current position. Let's go have a look at how that works in detail. As you saw in the picture, that black thing at the bottom is our phaser, and here's our drawing for it. Here's what's going to happen. We have pressure applied, and this is blocking both ports right now. That's 50% duty cycle. You're going to find that most of the time, the vehicles in 50% duty cycle will go away for short times and return to 50%, holding its current position. At 75, it's going to advance it by sending pressure to the advanced side. At 25, it's going to retard it by sending pressure to the retard side of the valve and then go back to the holding position. Remember, it's always going to go away and come back unless it's stuck and not moving. 
So the duty cycle control is varied around this midpoint known as the holding mode, which is 50% duty cycle. Current will be in the middle of its range. This holds the valve in its center position. Cam timing is retarded with lower duty cycle, which results in lower current flow. Cam timing is advanced with higher duty cycle, which results in higher current flow. The pulse width is based on duty cycle where the amount of time the signal is high is compared to the amount of time it's low. Now, what we have to decide is what type we have. Here's 50% high, 50% low. That's the holding pattern. Here's 90% high, 10% low. To interpret this, we need to know if we have a high side driver or a low side driver. We'll talk more about that later. Here's the opposite, 90% low, 10% high. If we're 90% high with ground side switching, we have 10% duty cycle because the ground side is on only 10% of the time. To achieve the same thing with high side switching, it would be high only 10% of the time. The 10% is where you've got high side or low side. Be aware of what you're looking at. Understand, if you use a multimeter, it may not agree with what you see on scan data. Try to use scan data where you can. Here's what a typical circuit looks like. We've got B plus hooked in to one side, going to ground side on the other. This is a low side driver, ground side control, whatever you want to call it. Here's 50% duty cycle where we're holding it in position. Here's 20%. Remember, it's active when we ground it. Therefore, it's only 20% duty cycle. We're going to be retarding the timing. Here's 80% duty cycle. We're going to be advancing the timing. This is a rotary vane. Notice on the left, low duty cycle is for retarding, which results in lower current flow. If you look at the valve, it's almost closed. Higher duty cycle is for advancing, which results in higher current flow. Notice the same vein is now open much wider. It is going to give us advance. Whichever one of these it goes to, it should quickly return back to 50% once it gets in position. So you'll see 50% like the middle, and when you're in the various percentages, over at 85 this port's open very wide. But at 50%, it's equal on both sides. And at 33%, it's very narrow over on the right side. When you judge these, looking at this rotary vane, you have to look at the same port each time. This is what's going to happen. The oil flow is going to change with duty cycle. Obviously, when they're both are closed, oil flow is minimal. As we go down or up, either way, oil flow goes up. It's going to increase as we go away from 50% duty cycle. High rates of oil flow is a problem when the solenoid becomes contaminated. It's important. We don't need to keep beating it up. Now, GM has a slight variation. They have a high side driver on their continuously variable system, which means ground is on one side and the PCM supplies B+. That's why we told you earlier, you have to understand which ones you're looking at to be able to interpret which one is high side, low side, what's 50%, what's 20%, what's 80 Now we're high 80% of the time. So it all depends on whether you have a ground side or high side driver. Both drivers, low and high side control, doesn't matter. The whole position is in the center, 50% duty cycle with a current in the center of its range. Chrysler has a different system. It has a single overhead cam with continuous facing. It is based on a cam within a cam. The cams are made from a solid inner shaft and a hollow outer tube. Let's take a look at that. It contains two different types of cam lobes, meaning the exhaust and the intake are mounted to different parts. The fixed cams, these are fixed to the outer cam tube. Moving cams, these are pinned to the inner camshaft through slots in the tube so that it can be moved. These slots are important it allows us to move. The phase of the moving cam is controlled by an inner camshaft, and the phase of the fixed cams is controlled by the outer cam tube, which is fixed. That's going to be the same. The exhaust lobes are conventionally attached to the outer shaft. So in this particular system, we're going to be cam phasing the intake valves. The intake lobes are keyed to the inner shaft with pins that slide in the slot in the tube. That's an important thing to think about. Right now, we have 45 degrees of authority on the current systems out there, utilizing, uh, comparing it to the cam, exhaust cam tube. Minimum cam phasing, 
minimum overlap for a nice, smooth, quiet idle with clean emissions. Maximum cam facing, large valve overlap to boost power. What would be bad for idle? Between idle and 3000, we're going to start increasing the amount of overlap, depending on the throttle position. And somewhere between there, we're going to get to maximum overlap, which will give us maximum power. Here's the way it's constructed. First, we have a slot right there. Remember, this inner tube is going to be able to move back to the left and right, increase and decrease. We need the slot. We're going to attach the exhaust valves right to the outer tube. They're fixed. But this valve here is connected through a pin to the inner tube, which is going to be connected through that slotted tube and allow it to move in relationship to the outer shaft. It's controlled by a phaser down here at the bottom. It's going to be moving the inner shaft. The outer shaft is going to be moving right with the gear driven by the, the timing chain. So our phaser control is a one we've been looking at before. It's attached to the inner shaft. Here you're looking at a close-up where you can see it pinned together. Those two together with a pin in the middle, they're the variable ones. Now let's look at how this looks in actuality. Here's Chrysler's single overhead cam. The top left, you see how the inner tube has been removed from the outer tube, the intake versus the exhaust. You can see the different movements in the charts. And here is our cams right here as we look at them as they're attached here to the chain. And you can see our different controllers. Now GM has a slightly different one. They use a low oil flow phaser. It does some specialized things. It's called a torque assist phaser. And this is kind of a name we gave it. It has been referred to as the third generation phaser. It's very fast, very quick. And it's used the torque of the cam against the spring and the valves is used to help move the vein. Now the torque from the valve springs opening is going to change position and the force of the valve springs closing is going to change position. Depends on what it is. The oil pressure is used to lock and unlock the vein at a particular time so we can take advantage of this positive or negative torque to either open or close the vein. We can see it right here. If we look at this vein and talk about it, when the cam is opening, the valve must overcome the spring, which is a positive torque. If we unlock the oil lock, it will allow this to retard timing in this positive torque. Now, once it's going across the cam, it's going on the other side, it's trying to rotate the cam forward, it's negative torque. If we unlock it at this time, it's going to rotate the cam earlier and cause it to advance timing. What happens is we can move it much faster than the hydraulics. The other advantage of this system is it can operate with dirtier oil. Downside, to keep this working, GM put a filter in front of their phaser controlling this, the lock and unlock. They didn't want it getting clogged with oil. And in very severe cases of uh, contamination and poor engine uh, maintenance, we find that the screen gets clogged up and we have to remove the front cover of the engine to clear up this problem. So even though it's a great system, it still has problems. Now we refer to this as variable valve timing as phase two. This is where we're going to do everything. CVC has more adjustments than just the two discrete steps we had in phase one. Continuous valve timing can be adjusted to match a much wider range of operating conditions. 20 to 25 degrees of cam timing is required to totally eliminate the ex external EGR. That makes for much better engine performance. The operating pencils are the same as discrete steps, except the variable valve adjustments have more authority. The same type thing we've before. Minimum overlap on hard acceleration. We don't want any EGR. We need maximum power. That'll give us the dotted line. The shaded area is our range of authority. That's from max to minimum, which we can do. The PCM will determine the ideal timing based on operating conditions. The newest thing is to control both the exhaust and the intake cam phasing for the latest trend. This gives us the most possibility. Phasing the exhaust valve improves fuel economy and reduces emissions. Hydrocarbons reduced by late exhaust valve closure, recirculating some of the leftover HC in the exhaust. NOx is reduced with internal EGR and the wide timing authority that varies with conditions. Double Vandos is an example of that at BMW. Ford's variable valve timing in their very latest models has both. GM's latest CVVT has both. Honda's IVTEC has continuously variable, both of them. Uh, the Hyundai Kia continuously variable valve timing 
does both intake and exhaust. Mitsubishi, my VEC, has does both intake and exhaust. Nissan's continuously variable valve timing does intake and exhaust. Toyota's variable valve timing with intelligence does intake and exhaust. Volvo's does variable valve timing with intake and exhaust. So the summary is the cam timing is going to vary between 0 and 50 degrees of crank rotation. The maximum authority varies with engine design. What this is going to do is allow us to eliminate the EGR and do a lot of improvement and match the cam precisely to engine operating performance.